Welcome to another moment in the Word. Who's your hero? Who are you following? Who do you want to emulate? Well, we find in this passage that we're looking at, it's John chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. As we meditate on it, we'll find who we should be emulating. And we find in verse 3, To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls and his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him. For they know his voice, and a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. If your Bible is open, and I pray it is, you'll need to follow very, very carefully, because as we look at this, we want to remember the audience. Jesus is speaking directly to the Pharisees. The Pharisees that are in the crowd that are gathered around Jesus, that includes his disciples, it also includes the man that was just excommunicated from the temple, from the synagogue, by the Pharisees, and Jesus is speaking specifically now to the Pharisees. And he says, to him, the porter opens. Now, who is the him? We have to look at the previous verse to find out. It says, he that enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. There is only one door. It is the door. There's a definite article there. The, the shepherd is actually, there is no article. So it would be a shepherd. The key idea, the key focus in verse 1 is the door. The key focus in verse 2 is the door. Jesus will identify himself in verse 7. I am the door. In verse 9, I am the door. So the door is the focus. So therefore, when we look at verse 3, we find to him. To him is referring to the door. To him, the porter, or the one who is the doorkeeper. That one is going to, to him, the door is opened. Now, we need to understand what exactly is a doorkeeper. The word means a guardian, one who cares for the door, one who is opening the door, and is opening the door to the shepherd, to the shepherd, the chief shepherd, the good shepherd. And so, as we find the doorkeeper would be a shepherd or would be someone hired to care for the sheep while the shepherds are gone. It's nighttime. The shepherds go back home or they would go to an inn to rest for the night. So, the shepherd is physically gone. The doorkeeper then takes care and watches over the sheep, guards the sheep. That's the function of the doorkeeper or the porter, is to take care of the sheep in the absence of the shepherd. I want to submit to you that that doorkeeper, and there is a definite article, is the doorkeeper, the Holy Spirit. Now, where is the Holy Spirit? Today, he is indwelling the believer in the absence of the physical presence of the Lord Jesus. Jesus is coming again, and when he comes again, then we will be one with him. However, at the present time, the doorkeeper, the Holy Spirit, is taking care. Now, notice this is going to distinguish between those who are true under-shepherds because that's what the word pastor means. The word pastor means shepherd, and those who are the false shepherds, who are later called the strangers. So now let's look and see what the shepherd does, or what the chief shepherd, what the door does, the one who is the way. And it says to him, the porter opens, the Holy Spirit preparing that soul so that they open. The word open is used in regards to fish opening their mouth. It's referring to heaven being opened and the, the uh, saints being raised up with the Lord Jesus 
to be forever with him. And it's also referring to a heart being open so that he gives access to the sheep. The porter has been there all night, now daybreak. The shepherds return. The porter then steps out of the way in the door of the uh, sheep pen and allows the shepherd to call his sheep. Now, in eastern countries, the shepherd usually has his own sound. It'll sound like a bird call, or he may sound uh, make a peculiar sound, maybe like a sheep. But this is not a eastern shepherd only. He calls his sheep by name. And by calling them by name, he's calling them individually. And not only does he call them individually, he calls them personally. And the word that is used there for call, it's a really fascinating word. It's phone. Phone, when you think of phone, you can think of your English word phone. It's a personal call. It's not a robo call. It's not where there's just simply they're calling and they're trying to sell something. No, this is a personal call. He knows you and he knows you by name. It's not the other word that's commonly used in, in the Greek New Testament, kale, which we get our English word call from. It is a personal invitation, not a, an authoritative public announcement. It's personal. It's personal to you. I think of the time that Jesus, he's coming out of, out of Jericho and he sees uh, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is trying to get a view because he's smaller than everyone else. And not only that, he's somebody that's a tax collector for the Romans and thereby is not real well accepted. But Jesus sees him. He sees him up in the tree and he calls him by name and he says, Zacchaeus. Come down, make haste. I'm coming to your house today. And he called him by name. Or that Jesus, at the tomb of Lazarus, the week before he himself will be crucified, he is seeing the crowd that is weeping for Lazarus, who has been now dead for more than three days. And Jesus cries out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He is calling us by name. Perhaps the most touching of all is when Jesus, after his resurrection, on Resurrection Sunday, that he is at the tomb, and he says to Mary Magdalene, Woman, why are you weeping? And she thinks him to be a gardener. She hears his voice, but notice, Jesus calls her by name, and he says, Mary. That's all he said, just Mary. And she turns around, she looks at him, and she calls him Rabboni, my rabbi, my teacher, my master. And so Jesus calls us. It's a personal invitation, and he calls you by name. The Lord knows you by name. There is more than 6 billion, almost 7 billion people on this planet right now. But he knows you by name. And notice, he not only knows you, but it also says he leads them out. Now, it's in the context of this man who was kicked out of the synagogue by these Pharisees. And he leads them out. And the word in the Greek is exago. And, and you get a picture. Exit means out. A go means to move or to go, to be led. And, and Jesus has led, and maybe he's led you, where you can see that you grew up in a certain group or association or denomination. And, and as you looked, you realized there were things that God was teaching you. He's led you out. And, and actually, these Pharisees were doing the Lord's work. I want to remind you of two passages. One is in Ezekiel. It's in chapter 34 and verse 13. It reads like this. I will bring them out from the peoples. Now I will bring them, it's speaking of Israel, from the peoples, from the Goya. And the Goyim is referring to the Gentiles, from the nations, from the peoples, and gather them from the countries. And I will bring them to their own land. That's already happened. 
Jesus has brought them out, the Jewish people, Israel, from all of the lands, worlds, nations, and he has brought them, and he says, I will feed them, and I will bring them to the mountains of Israel, and in the valleys, and in all the inhabited places of the country, I will feed them. Wow, isn't that a wonderful picture? You're seeing it today. The return of Israel is precisely what this passage is referring to. I will lead them out. But notice also one more, and this is Moses now speaking, and it's nearing the end of his ministry, and he says, in chapter 27, verses 15 to 18, then Moses spoke. He spoke to the Lord, and it is the yod Hey, Vav, Hey, and he is speaking. It is the one who is the I am. And he's saying, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. That man is the God man, the Lord Jesus Christ, over the congregation who may go out before them and go in before them that they may lead them out and bring them in that all the congregation of the Lord may be like not like sheep having no shepherd. Now this is verse 18. Who is that one? And the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua. Take Yeshua. Or if you want to pronounce it in English, take Jesus. You see, Yeshua or Ye Yeshua is salvation. It is what Jesus' name means. He leads us out by his name. So now we find in verse 4, and he brings them out. He casts them forth. He thrusts them forth, his own sheep. And he goes before them. And the sheep follow him. The word for follow is the same idea of one who is a disciple. He is discipling you right now. And the reason why we spend time in the word is it's because of his word that we, his sheep, hear and follow. We know his voice, and the word for know there is the word oida. We know from within. How do we know from within? Because within the believer is the Holy Spirit. You know instinctively what is true and what is not. You may not know all of the technical terms of theology. That's quite all right. But even a newborn babe in Christ knows when they're listening to something and it sounds true and it is true and they can also hear heresy and they know it's not true and thereby I encourage you be students of the word by being students of the word one who desires the sincere milk of the word you'll grow thereby you will know what is true you can read all the books about the Bible and be still lost. But if you read the Bible and you hear the voice of the one who is the door, the only way, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free and you will be his disciple indeed. Now verse 5, they will by no means follow a stranger. What is a stranger? One who is strange, first of all, a foreigner, an alien to the door. One who is not by the way, or as Jesus described as we looked yesterday, trying to come into the sheep pen by any other way than through the only door. Remember, the sheep pen looks very much like the tabernacle in the wilderness. There's only one way, and that one way is Jesus. And so there are false teachers, and there are many false teachers. There are many false messiahs. And Jesus is saying, my sheep will not hear their voice. They will know that that voice is not God. And in fact, they will flee. And the word to flee means to escape, to run as if they were running from a wolf, to run as if they were running from the plague. They will run and they will run from that false teacher because they do not know the voice of strangers. You know the voice of God 
because you've been reading God's Word. You've been meditating on God's Word. You've been feeding on God's Word, and thereby your life's changed. But in being changed, you'll also know the voice of the false teachers, and you will avoid them. I pray, dear one, in this time in which we live, that if you're a pastor, you're teaching the Word, and you're being instant in season and out of season, and reproving and rebuking and exhorting with all along suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when your disciples, those who are following you, that they will not give heed to sound doctrine, but will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I pray that as people follow you, you tell them what Paul said, be followers of me, even as I'm a follower of him. We're simply like the one who is the doorkeeper, the porter, having the Holy Spirit within us, calling people to listen to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word, and thank you that your word is forever settled in heaven. It doesn't get modified or edited, revised. Your word is forever settled, because your word is true and absolute, and your word saves us. We pray if there's anyone listening that does not know the Lord Jesus, and that definitely needs to acknowledge their sin, but to acknowledge him, that his blood alone cleanses us, that they, Father, are saved. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.